Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller. I'm Susie Younger. An African-American licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed therapist. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias. Anything that marginalizes and oppresses. As a white woman, I ask the questions white people are too afraid to ask. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, Susie and I will have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? You know when you hear that so-and-so is a people person? Well, our next guest today, Eden Alpert, gives new meaning to that phrase. A native Angelino, Eden has grown up in and around the music industry. Her dad is an icon, the legendary Herb Alpert. Eden is a true connector. She truly loves to connect people to worlds that they wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. Eden, who has her degree in fashion from the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, uses her sense of style to create spaces where people come together to make music and often donate for her special causes. She's managing director of the incredible jazz club, Vibrato Bar and Grill, where everyone has played, including I Am Music production company, Giovanna Clayton and Stevie Wonder, just to name a few. She was taught early on about philanthropy and she's here to tell us all about her life today. Welcome, Eden. Thank you. So nice to be here. Hi, Eden. It's a pleasure to meet you and thanks for coming on. Nice to meet you as well. Maybe one day we'll do this all in person again. <laughs> Could you imagine? That would be incredible. I'm very happy. I'm a very, you know, I like the touch and feel. Yeah, which is a little bit risky these days. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so first thing I know I'm wondering, I'm sure others are as well. What was it like to grow up as Herb Albert's daughter? Not too much pressure, I'd imagine. Well, I think back then being a celebrity child was so different. I think um, in in the 70s, 80s, when it was affecting me, uh, everybody seemed to be maybe growing up in Beverly Hills, everyone seemed to kind of have a celebrity parent, but we didn't know that, okay. if that makes sense. Yes. Um, so, you know, like Shirley Jones's son and um, Marvin Gaye Jr. And there were just so many, but because we, it was just normal to us. My life was not normal. I mean, her became famous. I think the year I was born was one of the biggest years when he really exploded in 1966. So I think that I never had a normal life. You know, it was it, one being adopted and, and then two being the child of a, of a huge celebrity. And I was the age of when it was the biggest. Does that make sense? Yeah. So my brother was older than me and then they were going through a divorce. So it was, a, it was a lot of, a lot of moving parts going on when I was very, very young. And it was, uh, it seemed normal to me, but now I know it's, you know, obviously wasn't. <laughs> so what age do you think that became real to you? Like, you know, these parts are moving and I'm having a hard time putting them in place. When did that start to become real I, for you? What age? I would say as a teenager uh, and, and I was in therapy the whole time since I was like eight um, and going to group therapy sessions too, which was very interesting. But I would say as a teenager, when I started to use it to my advantage. <laughs> as any teenager would just in your defense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I would get out. Then the police department was much different. I would get out. I wasn't a bad girl, but I had little things, you know, that we do when you're a teenager that probably weren't the best choices. Okay. Um, and I would get out of, you know, things because the police, I knew the whole police department in Beverly Hills. They were cool guys. We all be, it's a small community, believe it or not. Okay. Um, and then, you know, to get into places and going to concerts, everything was VIP, you know, and I don't know any other way back then. So you had a whole, yeah, like you said, like totally realistic for being in Beverly Hills, but not realistic for the rest of us. So you were managing this world that seemed real. But as you later found out, was not as real as you thought. Is that fair to say? It is very fair to say. Okay. So what was the greatest lesson you think you learned along the way? Well, I think that's a really good question. Um, 
there are many that I learned along the way, but I think moving out of California and having a, a open eye experience about where we live is not realistic, it, like LA in general, but then 90210 was a whole other spectrum. So moving to Chicago and people putting me on some kind of pedestal, you know, oh, you're Hollywood. Oh, you're Herb Alpert's daughter. Oh, you're this. And me realizing that I just wanted to be normal. And that's why I think I moved away from here okay. so that I wouldn't feel that way. It, so, it was a eye-opening experience for me. So wait, so then you moved away, you had this reality, but then you moved back? I moved back because I, I met my husband and okay. I was very not working in the industry. You know, I was working in a rest at California Pizza Kitchen in Chicago. I met my husband, then we moved to Michigan, then we moved back. But um, it, it was normal life. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't what life was here growing up and what it is even just living in California, in LA in general. Okay. Okay. And so look, I'm not telling you anything you don't know about the industry and mental health. So it's, it's really helpful to hear that you sought out therapy. Would you say that's been the most effective tool in your life to manage um, the changing environments and pieces? I mean, I get goosebumps when you say that, because I feel that we're all a work in progress till the day we die. I feel that we all have something uh, you're never done, but yes, you want an end game to therapy. You know, you want to, but there's always work that needs to be done. And I was that child that always seeked what's, you know, whether it was life spring or est back then. Yeah. Now, I remember those. Now for me, it was the Hoffman Institute, which was an intensive eight day program as a 40 something year old who had patterns. I had patterns. And the biggest thing we need to do is learn how to redirect those patterns and create a new story for me. Right. Well, I, I, I kept doing it. I think that's pretty, I'd normalize that completely. I mean, you get used to doing something. The pain of familiarity is better. Sometimes people think than the pain of the unknown. So right. it's easy to get that groove to fit back in and go right back to what you once knew. So that totally makes sense to me. Would you say that, I'm going to ask when, when would you say that your identity sort of came into its own? I'm going to say about, and maybe Susie might be able to relate to this. I don't know. A few, when I met my husband and he told, this is how sad, <laughs> it's not sad. It's just, you know how people always say, I wish I knew all this stuff when I was younger. We learn yeah, it, we say that. learn it exactly when we're supposed to, right? Um, but I think at about, well, I would say eight years ago, my husband came to me and said, you need to put your foot down with your dad. We're partners in the restaurant. Okay. And I just was kind of allowing a lot of stuff to happen that I'm good at what I do. And yes, I'm very social and I'm totally the opposite of my dad. But I was like, if you don't start listening to me, I'm out. And I'm the face of the place. I'm the one who's created what it is. And I think him saying, if you don't go tell your dad, I will. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to put my big girl <laughs> panties on. And, it, and I, when I say it's, sad, I shouldn't say it's sad that it took that long, eight years ago, you know, as in my late forties to really, you asked a question about my identity. That's part of it. That's part of my working identity, right? I think when um, somewhere in my forties, I discovered that Everyone likes me for me, not because of Herb. I do realize that people introduce me as Herb Alpert's daughter, and I'm totally okay with it. But then I go, but I'm Eden, and I'm totally different. I'm a totally separate person than him. Yeah. I don't get insulted. I understand why people do it. They're, you know, they, they honor and love my dad, and, and I don't get angry at it anymore. Well, you know, it's also, it's a way for people to connect longevity. Yeah. And you didn't just pop out of anywhere you, you had a path. So I think that's, what's helpful is people say, Oh, now I see how, you know, so much about, and you're able to navigate the way you are. Otherwise it looks a lot like just luck. And yeah. I, I think that's more, I don't know, shocking <laughs> that anybody can be that lucky. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's, it's helpful as a pathway. Uh, the other thing is you mentioned um, adoption. How has that played a part in your life? Well, it's played a huge part, a part, uh, a huge part when I did the Hoffman Institute, of me learning, um, you know, how important it is from the minute you're 
uh, born, you know, while you're in the womb. And then when you're born, those first six months are imperative. Yeah. Um, so I don't know where I was the first six months. So my friend and I, Jeff Forney, another adopted friend, we talked about maybe we do a documentary about that. A lot of people don't know. I know that I was adopted through Vista Del Mar, but whose hands was I in? Who, mm-hmm. who was coddling me? Who was holding me? I never had an issue with being adopted with my adopted mother. I mean, with my mother that gave me up. I had an issue with the woman that was married to my dad because she was not a nice person. So I would say, why the frig did you adopt me? Right. Like you're an alcoholic. You're jealous of me. It's not my fault. You and dad got divorced and I have this relationship, but she just, that's what I used to say. Right. And then when I did Hoffman, I learned all that stuff was her own stuff and her patterns. And she just didn't know any better. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't mean it didn't hurt your heart and challenge your my heart. I never felt loved enough by her. So I did by dad, kind of. I, I really feel loved by my dad now. But, you know, he was so big and busy and into his own thing. And he's in love you, dad, but you're a narcissist. And it's all about her. So, you know, and I know this about him. But to not have that mother love that I think a lot, we didn't hang out. We didn't do much together, you know? So it was, I craved it. And then when I met my birth mother, that was like a whole other thing, but adoption to me, I feel very lucky. I feel like I was a chosen child, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I wouldn't be where I am right now if it weren't for them and Vista Del Mar and my birth mother. So, so you met your birth mother and it changed. Do you say a little bit about that? Well, I met her when I was 27 because I was looking for, um, inf- I don't know what I was looking for actually at the time. I think it was the first time I was looking to see if I had another brother or sister. Oh, okay. Blood. I really didn't want to hurt my parents because even though they say it's not going to hurt them, it it's a little bit of a knife. I wasn't looking for another mother. I can tell you that. And then I saw her because of all my eating issues <laughs> uh, and I had a heart attack. It was such a letdown. It wasn't what, and this is going to sound bad, but I'm very, I had a mom who would call me thunder thighs if I would gain weight. Um, my mom was very, very tiny and skinny. So I was bulimic in high school. Um, so I saw my mom and she was extremely overweight and a big, tall woman and not this beautiful woman that I, th- she was beautiful. She's a beautiful human, but I was very, right. very visual. <laughs> So I sound very catty right now, but you know, you have all these expectations and they were extremely high and I allowed her in my life for a long time. And now we're not, we're not really speaking. Um, She's just a piece of, she's a really loving, lovely woman, but not, I don't need another mother in my life. (laughs) I hear that. Um, (laughs) You know, I appreciate you saying, dad, I love you. And you're a narcissist. I think that's honest. You know, that's why I was nodding. Not because I know her. (laughs) I'm (laughs) nodding because I think it's very healthy to love people, you know, say this. And, you know, I I just, I appreciate that. So I just want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. And also I appreciate your honesty about people not being what you thought they were going to be and accepting that you either choose to have them in your life or not. There's so much pressure to keep people in your life just because they're supposed to be in your life as opposed to recognizing, you know, that just may not be right for me right now. And, and I'll live with the consequences and it's still my choice. So I mean, I have that. guilt sometimes like any other person, because I feel like I know she has no one else. And I'm that she wrote me a beautiful card for my birthday last week, basically just saying, you know, I think there's not a day I haven't thought about you when I, from when you were born. And she was very receptive when we met, but it's just not, I talked to my dad about it because I was like, this is very selfish, but I found her for what I needed to. And I did something selfish for the first time and I'm going to wipe my hands of this. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, just my opinion, which doesn't have to mean anything. Yeah, I, like that. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know that that's how I would describe selfish. You know, I think it's self-preserving and uh, sometimes you need to do that. You, you yeah. went the early part of your life the way you had to without her. And sometimes, you know, yeah the shoe changes foot and it yeah. is the way it is. So I, again, appreciate your authenticity around that. So just looking over your life with where you are right now, what would you say is the biggest mistake and the greatest lesson that you've made? Oh my goodness. You're asking really biggest mistake and 
less. And the biggest mistake, mm -hmm. oftentimes from our biggest, biggest mistakes come our greatest lessons. Yeah. Um, well, I think some of my biggest mistakes were not being more authentic when I was younger and oh. my truth mm -hmm. and, 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 and protecting my space um, and not allowing uh, a lot of stuff that went on to go on as long as it did. I could have walked away from stuff. And my dad was very supportive. You know, I have that enabler in me from having an addict mom and people pleasing. And I don't do that anymore. I mean, Susie might say sometimes I do because I'm in an industry where that's, you know, it's about the other people. It's not about me. Sure. But, um, and I have to do that at work, but I won't allow, I don't know if I can swear, but yes, I, I don't allow bullshit in my space anymore. And I call people out on it w with as much love as I can. I'm a really good communicator. I think okay. I, I just can't anymore. And, and my biggest mistake was allowing all this toxic stuff in my life for too many years mm -hmm. and, and then bitching about it. Guess whose fault that is mine. Because if you, if you set boundaries and that's probably my one word that I have a really hard time with, without feeling like I'm hurting someone's feelings. I, I believe if you say something with kindness, however, they take it as their problem. Right. Right. Yeah. Boundaries are offensive to people who don't like boundaries. <laughs> I, know. I know. And I, I honor him. If you, I have a new manager and he said, don't call me on my day off anymore. Well, none of my managers has ever done that to me. And I'm like, okay, I respect that. Yeah. I won't, you know, and, and that's his boundary. You know, I don't say it quite like that. I'm a little nicer. Like, look, it's my day off. I prefer that you not reach out to me on Mondays. Mm. Period. You know, I, I just say things with a lot of kindness and love. I, I don't ever want to hurt someone, you know? Yeah. You know, look, I, I, I like to think that, you know, most of us don't want to actually hurt someone. So if we do, you know, the impact might be hurt feelings and we have to deal with apologizing if we take, feel sure. like we have responsibility. Otherwise, people need to sit in it. Yeah. Right. Can't take. I am, I am a tough cookie and people and, and I, I put up with a lot. And then when I'm done, I'm like, no, you're not. No, let me break this down for you. How this. Yeah. Really, and I'm the first one to apologize when I'm wrong. I absolutely will do that. Yeah, that's healthy. So yeah. when did giving back so actively become a part of your journey? So my my aunt Mimi, who's my dad's sister, is very involved in Vista Del Mar, which is the number one child and family services organization in the state of California. They've been around 114 years. So at 12, she started taking me to these events that they would do with all the kids that live on campus part time and full time. You know, there's some that aren't there on the weekends and there's ones that are on lockdown. Um, and I would go to these dance, these Christmas parties, and I very young started getting into that. And then also my dad took me to the Ringling Brothers when there were still circuses that we would all go to. This is how much I'm dating myself. The <laughs> Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, I think it was called. That's what it was. Um, and we went with the children's hospital and some of the kids were severely burned on 90% of their body. And he's always, my family's always thrown me in the mix of we have, we give back. Whether for me, at, obviously at a young age, it was more about putting your hands in it. I didn't know anything about giving money. So as I got older, I have a, a whole policy for me is to, if you're going to donate, you got to get involved. If I'm going to be a big donor, I better be working in the kitchen at Project Angel Food or delivering food. And with Vista, we painted 140 van tennis shoes that were donated in um, honor of my birthday. And we went there all day and worked with the kids and we're just there. Um, I, uh, Concern Foundation, same thing, cancer research, uh, you know, and I'm going to Rwanda on Wednesday because I'm part of Omni Peace, which is building music schools in Africa. Okay. So yeah, I do a lot. <laughs> so, so, so the, the monetary part is of course important because without it, you wouldn't be able to do the rest. You wouldn't be able to be there. So it's, 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 uh, I think it's, it sounds like it's beneficial to you to be present. You know, that sort of sounds like where you really feel it. Is that, does that yeah, sound I right? Think it's, I mean, I love, my mom gave us one of the greatest gifts and she left a foundation, a, a substantial foundation. And I had to fight to sit on the board because we weren't on the board. And my, I'm like, I would rather you leave it to a foundation than hand it to me personally, because guess what? I get to make, we get to make a difference 
with mm-hmm. this money that she left and to stand up and say, I'm going to donate this to you. And I hope it makes a difference is so rewarding to be able to help. I, I would only do this if I could. Mm-hmm. I mean, philanthropy and, and seeing children, first of all, children to me are number one, yeah. you know, because children should never not feel safe. They, the abuse that goes on, the trafficking that goes on right now, all the things when you, I'm at Vista and I see how they're cutting themselves. I, I didn't have it that bad. That's, mm-hmm. you know, everyone's story is painted a different color, but w- when you really don't feel safe as a child in which you have no control over mm-hmm. because you're a child, um, it really hits me hard. Yeah. So um, I didn't have that life. I was raised, yes, with money and luxuries, but I was abused in a different way. Hmm. So you so, understand the pain of abuse. Oh, um, I think that's, you know, it's a significant bond that you have, even though yours was different. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you mentioned um, being an adult child of an alcoholic, and, and I wanted you to talk about that a little bit because p- that's a thing. I don't think enough people know that that's a real thing. And when I'm teaching and people leave that out completely, you know, I say you, you completely left out a huge part of this person's story. So I want you to give that a little airtime and talk about what you've learned about that in your life. So it took me a long, I mean, I was the kid who was throwing my mom in the shower and Mm -hmm. calling my dad and she, you know, we had a lot of phone lines. So I pushed the buttons down so she couldn't see me calling him and she would pick up the phone and say, I fucking hate you. And I'd be like, you know, how do you take that as an eight, nine year old kid? And I would go live with my dad. Um, and I think, and then, you know, when I would get drunk, when I was a teenager, I'd run around crying saying, I'm going to be just like my mom. I mean, I was a hot mess. Um, mm. I don't have an addictive personality. I did a lot of things that weren't smart, but it, any normal kid, I think might try things. Um, I mean, my mom was dropping cocaine vo- vials in the house and had jars of quaaludes around. So of course I was digging into that because back then that was huge. Right. Um, I even walked up to her and said, here's your cocaine bottle like that you dropped. And she just didn't even react like, oh my God, you know, she just didn't care. Um, so as I got older, I started to do Al-Anon because my stepmom had suggested Al-Anon to be because I was behaving like an addict myself, even though I wasn't an addict. Yeah. Um, and I was awful to my first husband who is not a good guy either, but I don't need to behave that I, I was a rager because mm. every time you let me down, like my mom would do and promise something and then she wouldn't show up or she would disappear or wasted and back at Betty Ford. Um, you know, if someone wouldn't follow through on something with me, I would explode. And it was like a defense mechanism. And I, I needed to stop doing that. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, I still have a little bit of it, but I'm aware of it yeah. when I turn brat, you know, like this bratty little child. So I want to, you know, when you're raised by an alcoholic, you have alcoholic behaviors, tendencies, you're an enabler, you, you let people walk. There's a lot of things that I've done. I'm not talking about anybody else, but I, I can only speak for myself. And, and there's a real thing around it. And it takes a lot of work. It never goes away. And I have a real big problem with alcoholics. Mm. I, I have a real big problem with them. I have zero tolerance. Well, it makes sense. It's a huge trigger for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, the people pleasing, the difficulty holding boundaries, um, tendency for codependency, all of those things you're describing were a part of your journey. And it mm. sounds like you have a perspective on it now that benefits you, but also benefits people around you who know you. I mean, I love talking about this because when people come to me for advice, there's something that just happened in my space recently with someone being abused. And my one friend said, I feel sorry for her. And I said, you know what? I don't, cause I've been there. I, yeah. I, I do understand a woman being abused by a man, both verbally and physically. And I was in that situation. Susie knows about this um, a long time ago. And I never went back into that again, but when you're abused as a child, any kind of abuse seems familiar. So I was going back to familiarity so when this friend said that about her, I said, I feel sorry for children that are abused and neglected and raped, but I don't feel sorry because we have a choice. My dad's always put this in my head. You have choices and you have a circle. I happen to have a good circle of friends around me. Some women don't. And this one particular woman does. So that's why I didn't feel sorry for her. I'm like, 
yeah. we're all telling you to get out of this. You have a choice, but you keep going back into it. Now I have to step away from you because we're, we're here to hold you. You have a group of people around you. The, you every circumstance is different. If that makes yeah. sense, you know, yeah. so some people I would feel, you know, they don't have a, 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 a tribe of people they can go to. I understand that. And I understand abuse and I know everything is different, but I just feel like we all can make choices and we all can change our story. Yeah. You really can change your story. You can, I, I, one of the lessons I learned and you asked me this earlier is um, to change, not let my story define me. Mm-hmm. And I could easily do that. You know, so one thing is that I think people make the mistake of having sympathy rather than having empathy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sympathy to me comes from a hierarchical place. You tend to seem like you're looking down on someone yeah. and feel sorry for them. And it does develop feelings of resentment. Right. Because I felt sorry for you the last 10 times and now you're doing it 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Whereas empathy is more like, I can imagine what it's like to be in that place where you wouldn't think you have the ability to do something different. And yeah. I'm going to create a boundary so you can realize that. Yeah. You know, I think that's what you're describing. I don't think it's. Yeah, I mean, this is what I said to her. I know it sounds like I'm because I've been dealing with this for uh, I've sat with her for hours and I did the empathy side. Yeah. You know, I can relate to you because I've been there and I get I know and I verbatim said to her what's going to happen if she goes back. And it happened. Right. I went back again. And then I was like, you're you're a 30 something year old successful woman. Yeah. You got a tribe of us around you saying we got you, mm-hmm. you know, and you're not broke and you're not living with this guy. Now it's a choice. So yeah. Empathy. That sounds like a boundary. I think that's a boundary, yeah. uh, the, the healthy boundary. Uh, that makes sense. I'm and I, 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 I say it again. I'm sorry. I missed that. But I'm still learning about those boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a healthy boundary. There's nothing. I mean, I think that's, that's what's healthy. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, and I appreciate you saying, you know, not everybody has access and resource to the same, um, opportunities and the same support systems. And I appreciate you clarifying that because I don't want people to listen and think, you know, oh, I should be able to do this when, you know, there's no need to shit all over yourself if there's a system that's oppressing you, right? right? You, need to, you need to work with, within 100%. the means you have. So I appreciate you saying that. So tell where everyone, huh, tell everyone where they can find you. So I'm, I'm at Vibrato Grill Jazz up in Bel Air most nights. Um, and I'm running around the room and it's right on our website at vibratogirljazz.com. I have a video says, and, and people have been doing this lately. There's a video, kind of a video I created for everyone. Why do you want to come to our space? And in it, I say, make sure you come and say hi to me. Um, oh. cause I love that. Now I'm not always there. I'm not there Saturday nights usually. Um, and I'm out of town for the next, you know, couple weeks, but you know, I love people to come say hi and, and, you know, find me there. They, people, yeah, I'm not that hard to find. I'm pretty out there. <laughs> <laughs> so what about on social media? Anything? Oh, at Stephen Alpert um, uh, on Instagram. And I have two Facebook pages because one page is full. So go to Eden Rue Alpert, R-U-E Alpert on Facebook. And I don't really do Twitter and all that. I, I feel overwhelmed just doing the Instagram and the Facebook right now. I, I need, I'm starting to hire people to help me out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, that's what everybody does. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a good delegator. That's kind of my controlling side. <laughs> well, dull child of an alcoholic. Yeah. hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. That's why I, can, I am an adult child. There's a yeah. really good book about adult children of alcoholics. Yeah. I wish I still had it, but it, it's, there's one book that's very good with, read if, if you're an adult child of an alcoholic it's very helpful because i think all my friends that are children of alcoholics have the same stuff going on right it's like looking in a mirror a little bit yeah. huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least it's validating right <laughs> yeah uh, yeah it's no joke <laughs> yeah no it isn't that's why i like to give it airtime. it's like it's a real thing you know seek the support you need so look, the world continues to be an unsafe pl- place for marginalized populations, including people who live in poverty and communities who are targeted by white supremacy in this country. What do you think changing the merit- narrative means now more than ever? Well, there is such a divide. So changing the narrative now is so important because dividing all this, all of us, the way we're being divided is 
so unhealthy for the next generation. If it mm-hmm. continues like this, we're fucked. Sorry. <laughs> I well, mean, just, I just said it like, no. sorry, okay. I'm super honest, but it, 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 my dad and I talk about this a lot. It can't keep going on like this. So I, and I don't know how, cause I'm one person and I would like to say a group of us can come together and make a difference. All I can do is make a difference to every person that I touch verbally or physically and, and just keep being compassionate and loving and, and learning. There's so much I have to learn about all this too. Sure. Um, we have to stay educated. We have to vote. You have to speak your voice. Yeah. When people don't, if they don't speak up and, and make a difference, we're not going to be able to change this. It's without violence, you know, that none of that needs to go on. There's, so, there's some scary stuff going on right now. It's just very scary across the globe. Mm-hmm. And, and, too many people, I don't know how much time I have left, but um, something happened to me last night at work where one of my servers got into it with me, a man about abortion. And he mm-hmm. goes, what's the difference between a man and a woman? And I went, well, I don't get triggered like that. So I said, I really got nasty. I said, so if you get raped in the rear end, you're going to tell me you can get pregnant from that? I mean, I, I just had to make some example. up. Sure. Because he's like, he's on that side of what's the difference between you and me. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I get all heated. It's <laughs> like, are you fucking kidding me in the middle of my restaurant? I was like, you need to walk away from me right now. And like, just, I can't, you really want to go there with me. If you want to tell me your, your opinion on abortion, but you're going to ask me what the difference between a man and a woman is. Wow. He's worked for me for 12 years. I I just, I don't get it. I just don't get it. So we need to, and I I will go back and tell him I love him, even though I don't right now. (laughs) And I don't know that I ever want to speak to him again because that's just ignorance. And where do you learn this? We learn it from the people that raised us. I really believe it starts with parenting. And there's a lot of really bad parenting going on right now. I like that you set another boundary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's another boundary. And that's a good one. So good for you. You can love people and have nothing to do with them. <laughs> it's just that's a boundary. It's not a problem. It doesn't feel good to feel like I did last night. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, now you know that boundary. You won't yeah. go back there again. Uh, the other thing is I really appreciate you said, and then I'm going to give you the final word. The other thing is speaking up. There's way too much silence and selective voices being used. If we don't speak up all the time about everything that's wrong, then people don't know where you stand. And if people don't know where you stand, then you can hide in the cuts. Mm -hmm. And how does that help? People have to use their voices. And the more privilege you have, the more voice you should use. So that's my final word. What's yours? Oh, my gosh. Well, (laughs) I'm going to just, you know what? Just be authentic. Be real. Speak your voice. Don't try to be someone you're not hiding in the, you know, that, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't feel good eventually when you do that because you need to speak out to somebody. Right. So I just, I, I, I love when people are authentic and they're real and they're true to themselves and please have compassion. Compassion is like something that's missing in this world right now. And the more compassion we have for each other uh, in, in every walk of life, because you don't know, if someone's upset you, what their issue is that day, yeah. what's going on with them. So I try to remember that. Although the whole abortion thing, all I want. <laughs> Except for, you know, what is that? What is that saying? Um, we can be friends as long as it's not about politics. <laughs> what is it like three or four things that they say? And it's very true. It's like, how can you be friends with people who just don't respect what you, what you believe so strongly? And I don't know, it sounds like a contradiction to me. So I, I appreciate that. Eden, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on Spinning Timeless and being so flexible about coming on. I know scheduling can be a nightmare. So I really appreciate your flexibility. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Thank hey, you. safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. It was very nice to meet you. I look forward to meeting you more, talking to you more. (laughs) It sounds great. See you later. Bye, you guys. Bye. Bye.